All right, so we are live, everyone. My name is Jesse Hildebrand, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And of course, there are no classrooms right now. All of you are stuck at home on YouTube. And so we really appreciate you continuing to tune in in our live, free, no registration broadcast with amazing scientists, educators, and facilities from around the globe. Today is really exciting for me because we bring in a new partner today. We are joined live in Toronto by Lawrence and she is at the Jane Goodall Institute of Canada. She's an educator and a scientist there. She manages their Roots and Shoots Amazing Youth Sustainability Program. And today she's going to tell us a little bit about Jane's story personally and all her pioneering work in East Africa, primates and her own adventures in East Africa, studying and following some of the coolest animals on the globe. So without further ado, thank you so much for joining us today, Lauren, and take it away. Hi everyone, I'm super excited to be here talking to you today. So I will load up my screen here so you guys can see my presentation. All right, great. Um, all right, so yeah, my name is Lauren and I work at the Jane Goodall Institute of Canada um, and I manage our Roots and Shoots program, which is our youth environmental sustainability program. Uh, where we kind of engage youth to make a difference in their communities and make the world a better place for people, animals, and the environment. Um, so I'm going to talk today a little bit about Jane, a little bit about primates, and a little bit about my own experience um, as I started out kind of similar to Jane doing field work in Africa with primates. Um, all right, so we'll get started. So just a little bit about our organization. So we are part of a global community conservation organization. So there are Jane Goodall Institutes all over the world. Uh, in many different countries, uh, and so we kind of all work together to advance the vision and work of Dr. Jane Goodall. And that work is protecting chimpanzees in Africa, and then also inspiring people all over the world to value and protect the natural world we all share to make the world a better place for people, animals, and the environment, and to really see that we all are interconnected. So hopefully most of you have heard about Jane. She is quite famous, um, but just a little bit of our background. Um, so Jane now is 86 years old. She just celebrated her birthday last week, which is very exciting. Uh, and right now she's staying at home in England, uh, staying nice and safe and healthy. Um, but way, way back, um, many years ago, she was a young woman who loved animals. And it all started really as a young girl with a dream. Jane grew up always loving animals. She had a dog growing up. And um, she really just felt a connection with animals. And she always wanted to go to Africa to study them. And she always says that when reading the Tarzan books, that Tarzan picked the wrong Jane. He should have picked her. Um, so really, it's awesome to see that as a young girl, she had this love and she had this dream and that she was able to make it happen. So Jane, when she got a little bit older in her 20s, she ended up actually going to Africa and meeting with Dr. Louis Leakey, who is uh, the man over here uh, in the slide. And he's a paleoanthropologist, which basically means he studied fossils of early human relatives that lived millions and hundreds of thousands of years ago to better understand our own behavior now uh, and our own evolution. But he thought it was also important that we go out and study our living uh, relatives in the ape and primate world. So we are great apes ourselves. And he thought it was important that we study our great ape living relatives. So that would be chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans, uh, and bonobos. So he asked Jane if she would go study chimpanzees in a place called Gombe in Tanzania, which is in Eastern Africa. And she jumped at the chance. This was what she always wanted to do. So she went out there with her mother, and that's in this slide on the left. Um, and she just kind of went out, not really having any background in science. She didn't go to school for science, but she knew animals. She always had this love and this, this appreciation for them. And so she just kind of went on her gut instinct in how to study chimpanzees. And she wasn't the only woman doing this at the time. She was part of a group called the Trimates um, that were three women. So we have uh, Diane Fossey on the left, Jane in the middle, and then Veruta Galdacross on the right. And all these women were asked by Do Dr. Louis Leakey to study primates. So Diane studied gorillas, the mountain gorillas in Rwanda, and then Veruta studied orangutans in Indonesia. Um, so these are some photos of Jane uh, as some chimps that she encountered. So the one on the left is David Graybeard, one of her favorite chimps. It was actually the first chimp that approached her and allowed the rest of the chimp troop to see that she wasn't a danger to them. Because most wild animals are afraid of humans. 
can we go study them in the wild? We have to do something called habituation. We have to get them used to us so that they're not scared of us. And this took Jane quite a long time because these chimpanzees were quite afraid of humans. Um, but it was David Graybeard that was the first chimp to kind of get close and show the rest of the troop that they could trust her. And what Jane discovered in the many years that she was studying chimpanzees was many different types of behavior. But one of the biggest discoveries she made was that chimpanzees use tools. So you can see that this chimpanzee is sticking a stick into a termite mound and taking those termites out and licking them up. And not only do chimpanzees use tools like this, we now know that they use stones to crack open nuts, they use rocks to crack open nuts, and many, many other different types of tools. And we see different tool use in different chimpanzee groups across Africa, which basically means that they have culture just like us. And this discovery at the time was monumental. And I love this quote by Dr. Lewis Leakey, we, mount, we now must redefine tools, redefine man, or accept chimpanzees as humans. Because at that time, we thought we were the only species that used tools. But now we know that not only do chimpanzees use tools, capuchin monkeys use tools, they use stones also to crack open nuts, and animals even like crows use tools. So really, we're not the only ones that do this. And it's really cool that we kind of have this connection with the animal world that we share this behavior with them. So not only did Jane discover that chimpanzees use tools, she also discovered that they show behaviors like love, empathy, compassion, but also have quite violent behaviors like a type of warfare as well. So she really kind of opened up the door to allow us to see that chimpanzees are so much like us and we are so much like them and allow us to kind of form that connection to an animal that we share 98.8% of our DNA. So Jane doesn't do field work so much anymore as she is 86, uh, but she does travel the world around to speak and inspire people to show that they all can make a difference too. And to kind of be a, this beacon of hope that we can make the world a better place because especially in times like these with climate change, we're in a pandemic, things can feel kind of hopeless, but she really is a beacon of hope. And recently um, she's come out with some amazing videos just expressing how we, can have hope, we can work together to make this world a better place. Um, so this was a photo taken in Ottawa, Ottawa when she was here last fall. Um, and so hopefully she'll be traveling again once everything kind of clears up and she can get out back to do what she loves to do. So that's kind of my summary of Jane, very quick, um, but if I'm happy to answer any questions at the end about her. Um, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit more about primates and what primates are, um, because primates, Chimpanzees are part of the primate family, so are we. We are great apes ourselves. Um, and primates are this amazing, cool collection of different species of animals that all share a sweet or specific group of traits. And they are mammals, just like say cats or dogs or um, horses, but they have different traits that make them unique from all those other mammals. So I'm gonna talk about those today. So some of these things, all of these things, you see, can see on your own body. So I want you guys to kind of make this a little bit more interactive to kind of check these things out on your own body as well. So primates have five fingers and five toes. Uh, and you can see in the picture here, we have a tarsier, an orangutan, a gorilla, and a human. They all have five fingers. Um, and what's really unique about us as primates is we have these opposable thumbs. So that basically means we can touch each finger to our thumb and to by having these opposable thumbs, we can grab pens, we can write, we can use tools, we can use forks, we can do so many things with these hands that other animals can't. If you have a cat at home, they can maybe grab things between their paws, but they can't use a paw to grab, say, a pencil. Um, so it makes primates really unique in that sense. What also is really cool about these grabbing hands is that primates can climb up trees and live, as most of them do, up in the forest canopy. Uh, and they use those grabbing hands instead of claws. So that's why we have nails instead of claws um, to, so we don't need those claws, like a, a squirrel would to climb up the tree. As well, we have these large forward facing eyes. So what is cool about this is that uh, most animals that have forward facing eyes are animals like say a wolf or a lion that are predators and carnivores that use those forward facing eyes to chase after prey whereas prey animals like a horse or a deer has eyes on the side of their head to make sure that they can see more around them to be able to run away if a predator comes after them. So some primates do hunt other animals. Chimpanzees are known to hunt monkeys. 
Um, tarsiers, which I'm going to talk about in a bit, do hunt insects. And obviously, as humans, we evolved as hunter gatherers too. But the main reason we have forward facing eyes is for depth perception. So, having these forward facing eyes allows us to navigate up in the forest canopy as primates. So, we can jump from tree to tree and make sure we don't fall to the forest floor and injure ourselves. And the biggest thing about our eyes is our color vision. Most animals, most mammals don't see in full color like we do. Most see in grays and blacks and whites or some specific colors and shades, whereas we can see in all the colors of the rainbow. And that's particularly important for primates because we, um, most primates in the wild eat some sort of fruit or leaf. So we call them frugivores or foliivores, or they kind of have a mix of both. And I know, I don't know about you guys, but I know that I don't really want to eat a green unripe strawberry, but I would love to eat a red ripe juicy strawberry. So fruits change color when they become ripe. So it's really important that primates can see that color change so they can eat those best ripe, the most nutritious fruits when they're in the forest. And the same with leaves. Young, tender leaves usually are a little lighter in color versus an older leaf that is more darker in color. So those are kind of some of the main things that make us unique in the animal kingdom. So I'm going to briefly talk about the uh, different primate groups. We have six. We have the lemurs, lorises, tarsiers, new world monkeys, old world monkeys. So lemurs are only found in Madagascar, so there is, which is a large, large island off the east coast of Africa. And I love lemurs. They're so cool. They're so unique. Um, I was lucky enough to actually go to Madagascar just as a tourist uh, and do a tour down there and see some amazing lemurs. Um, most of them are nocturnal. So that means they're awake at night and they sleep during the day. Um, and they actually have a better sense of smell than most other primates. So you can see in some of the photos that they have more of a snout like you would see in a dog or a cat. And that's because most of them use scent marking to show their territory, for females to show that they're ready to mate. Uh, we don't see this in any of any of the other groups of primates. Um, so here in the photo, we have um, many different primates. We have um, an eye eye up in the top corner, um, ring-tailed lemurs uh, towards the bottom. Uh, we have a mouse lemur at the bottom and a sifaka that's dancing, we call it, as they leap and bound across uh, the ground. So the next group are lorises and bush babies. So we have lorises at the bottom and then the bush baby on the side. Uh, lorises are found in Asia and bush babies are found in Africa. Again, these ones are, are nocturnal as well, so awake at night. Um, and what's um, frustrating about these species is unfortunately the slow loris in particular at the bottom are very endangered, um, mostly due to the wild pet trade. So you might have seen videos online of lorises as pets. I know I've seen one where one's eating like a little rice ball, but unfortunately sharing these videos makes people think that this is okay behavior, that we should be having these animals as pets, when really we shouldn't. All primates are wild animals that should be kept in their natural habitat. And if anything that comes out of this talk, I would love that you realize that primates shouldn't be pets. And if you see any of these videos online that show primates dressed up in human clothing or in a kind of a pet-like situation, to not share those. Because we don't want people to think that this is a common or good practice. Um, also, what's really cool about the slow lore, so it's the only venomous primate. So venomous animals are things like snakes that can bite and inject venom to protect themselves from predators. So what the slow lore will do is it'll bite, it doesn't inject venom, it doesn't have fangs, but it has this mix in their saliva that can cause a really, really painful infection in the bite. Um, so that's their way of protecting themselves, which is pretty cool. So then we have tarsier. And these are one of my favorites because they look like these little gremlins in the forest and they're so super cute. Um, so what's cool about tarsiers is they live in the Philippines. They're nocturnal as well, and they're really tiny. They're only about this big. And they only eat insects. So they're the only carnivorous primate that eats solely other animals and doesn't eat any fruits or vegetables. And they do this and they're able to hunt because these have these gigantic eyes that allow them to see really well in the nighttime. So you can see how big its irises get in the picture on the left, but their eyes are actually so, so gigantic that they can't move them around in their eye socket. So we can all move our eyes up and down and all around, but their eyes are so big that they can't actually do that. So they have to turn their head around and they can actually turn their head almost all the way around um, to see um, so they can hunt, which is super cool. 
All right, so now we have New World monkeys. So these live in South and Central America. Um, so typically in kind of the Amazon rainforest and habitats like that. They spend most of their time in the tree. And they do this because they have a prehensile tail. So their tail kind of acts like an arm or a leg and they can grab onto things with that. And the back of their tail has the same texture as the palm of our hand. So it's very grippy. So they can grab onto branches and get around the forest as well. Um, and there's a wide variety of New World monkeys from capuchins, squirrel monkeys, Tarsiers and marmosets, uh, ukari monkeys, saki monkeys, spider monkeys, and howler monkeys. So then we have old world monkeys. These guys live in Africa and Asia. They tend to have shorter tails and they live both in the ground and in the trees. So they do kind of a mix of both. And what's super cool is in the photo at the bottom uh, with the arrow, they have these things called cheek pouches. So you can imagine it's kind of like having a little backpack that you're able to put some snacks in for later when you want to have a little snack if you're hungry. Um, so they will go and they'll grab all the fruit that they can see in a bush or in a tree and they'll just stuff their cheek pouches. And then later on when they're hungry, they can have some food, which is pretty cool. All right, so now we get to the apes. So apes are where we live, with the group that we're in, where chimpanzees are, as well as uh, orangutans, gorillas, and bonobos. So bonobos are actually very similar to chimpanzees. They live in Africa as well, but in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And they're a little bit less aggressive than chimpanzees. Um, and they're female dominant versus chimps are male dominant, which is pretty cool. Um, but apes are the largest of the primates. Obviously, gorillas are the largest of primates out there. Uh, they live in Africa and Asia. So everything except um, orangutans live in Asia and the rest live in Africa. And we as humans evolved in Africa. And they have no tails. That's what makes uh, apes quite different than other, the other primates with no tails. And we have the largest brains of all of them. Also a longer lifespan. So 40, 50, even 60 years, uh, we can see particularly in like a captive zoo situation. And they have long arms. And that's because they do what's called knuckle walking. So they actually walk on their knuckles rather than flat palms like we would see with uh, monkeys. Okay, so that's a, a quick overview of primates. And now I'm gonna talk a little bit about my own field work. So I went to school for animal behavior uh, because I loved animals and I also really liked psychology. So it's kind of a combination of bio biology and psychology. Um, and so when I went to university, I got the opportunity to do a semester abroad in Tanzania for my third year. So I went in the fall for three and a half months um, to Tanzania. And part of that work that we did there was to do our own research project. And initially when I went there, I wanted to do work with big cats. I love lions, I love cheetahs, all those big cats. Um, but doing that work is a little difficult because you can't obviously walk around with big cats around. They would probably kill you. Um, so instead, I ended up falling in love with these cute, cheeky little vervet monkeys that would always try to steal food from our campsite. Um, so what I did, I worked out of a small game reserve that didn't have any large predators or dangerous animals. So I was actually able to walk around by myself following this troop of vervet monkeys. Um, and vervet monkeys are old world monkeys. They live in Africa. Um, and they're part of what we call the Gwenin family, which is a wide variety of, of um, monkeys so that most of them have very colorful faces, but vervet monkeys have these little black faces. And so basically my days, we're getting up super early. I usually get up around 5.30 um, because the monkeys will sleep in a tree overnight to protect themselves. But then around seven o'clock when it gets you know warm enough, they'll come down from the tree and start walking. So I needed to get to that tree before they started walking so I'd usually leave around six as the sun was rising from the equator in uh, Tanzania. Um, so the sun rises at six and sets at six. So I get up, walk to their tree. They come down, they'd walk around till about noon, looking for food, playing around, settle down around noon because it gets quite hot, um, take a rest in the shade, and then walk around in the afternoon and then go back to their tree in the evening. So I basically just followed them around as they did their daily activities. And I was studying their grooming behavior. So you can see in the one picture, they're grooming each other. And grooming in primates is a way that they kind of create their social bond. So just like we might talk on the phone, we might give each other a hug. Those are ways that we bond with each other as humans. But primates do the same thing, but with grooming instead. So I was looking at that behavior and it was really interesting. And really this whole experience was what kind of, was what, I don't know, 
allowed my whole future to kind of unfold uh, in front of me and allowed me to fall in love with Africa, fall in love with primates and see that this is what I wanted to do with my life. So then I ended up going to grad school uh, for evolutionary anthropology. So that's basically looking at our evolutionary past as humans and how we kind of become what we are today and looking at primates as uh, a way to study and learn about our own behaviors um, so we can understand our own evolution. So I went to Kenya to study all of baboons um, and all of baboons again are old world monkeys and my advisor had a field site in Kenya. So I went there for two months, uh, one summer to look at the behavior of mothers and infants. That's what I was really interested in was learning about how mothers raise their infants um, and what we can learn about that, about our own ways that we raise our infants. Um, so these are just some photos I took while I was out there. Uh, baboons can be quite aggressive, particularly the males. So you can see two are fighting in the one picture on the bottom. Um, and so sometimes we would just have to stand and hope we didn't become collateral damage as they would be running and racing around amongst um, us in the field, but it was pretty safe. Um, the only dangers out there really were large animals. So we had a Ascari or guard out with us every day who would keep watch for buffalo, elephants, animals that could be dangerous to us. Um, so one day we actually were out and we got surrounded by buffalo. So there were herds of buffalo all around us and we couldn't do anything. We just had to sit and wait for them to walk away because buffalo have very bad eyesight and tend to charge at anything that moves. So the, they don't care about the baboons. The baboons just walked away. But by the time the buffalo had kind of uh, spread out, uh, we lost our baboons. We couldn't find them for the rest of the day. And that's kind of field work. Some days are great and you can follow your animal all day and there's no issues, but then other days buffalo get in the way, other days there's torrential downpours and you can't go out into the field. So it really varies, but it's one of the most amazing experiences I ever had. I got to see so much beautiful wildlife. I got to fall in love with primates um, and spend this amazing time in a beautiful country like so this is me and Jane. Um, I am so happy to be working for the Jane Goddard Institute. Even though I don't do field work anymore, I don't work directly with primates. Um, my path took a little bit of a detour. Um, I got more into science and environmental education instead, but it feels like such, like my life kind of came full circle. I was able to do the work that I love in education and in science and work for an organization that has a, a leader and a visionary like Jane doing the work that I personally love to do as well. So it was an amazing experience and I couldn't be happier to be kind of pushing forward her work, her vision and her goals to make the world a better place for people, animals and the environment. So thank you. Fantastic. Well, thank you so, so much, Lauren, for what a neat presentation covering so much in a pretty short time. So way to go. <laughs> um, we've got people tuning in on YouTube from across Ontario, across Minnesota, basically a whole class in Minnesota, Washington State and more. So for anyone tuning in on YouTube, let me know where you're joining from. If you haven't already, type in as many questions as you can, and I'll pass as many to Lauren as we can do today. Um, but I want to start, because it's one thing you didn't get a chance to talk about, is your work on roots and shoots. So I know that we could talk about that for a whole other presentation, uh, but could you explain a little bit about what roots and shoots is to any kids that are stuck at home right now? Sure. So roots and shoots is our youth um, environmental program. We basically give resources to youth and to teachers or educators to help youth go out into their local communities to look for issues around people, animals, and the environment. So this could be issues like trash or um, pollution or um, not access to healthy, good food, whatever issues that they see. And we give them tools and toolkits to able to kind of figure out how to solve those issues. So really it's giving youth the power to figure out what's an issue in their community and giving them the space to come up with ideas and actions to solve those issues so they can see for themselves that they can make a difference and become kind of these leaders and change makers in their community. Very cool. So in addition to Jane Goodall Institute of Canada's website, which I will link in the chat bar, I'll also pass along roots and shoots so you guys can learn more about that as well. All right, uh, Pam and Osho want to know, do the monkeys have names? And you're studying these vervet monkeys or the baboons, do you name them? Do you number them? How do you identify them? Yeah, so um, with our field work in Kenya with the baboons, this was already an established field site. And yes, they all have names. So this is actually something that Jane pioneered with her work. Um, before she went to uh, Gombe, all of the chimpanzees just had numbers. They didn't have names. And when all scientific study was all just numbers because they were kind of this disconnect between our connection with them 
and cleaning them is kind of a research subject. Um, so yeah, so now we name all of the all of the monkeys we work with, and we actually do it the same way Jane does. So she'll name a female, and then all of the females that have that uh, are born with that mom have the same first letter of her name. So she had uh, Flo was one of her favorite females, so all of her infants had F first name. Yeah. Uh, for my introduction to Jane personally was with a book called In the Shadow of Man, which is one of the best public science communication books of all time. So I encourage anyone tuning in at home who's interested in the Jane Goodall Institute to check that out. It's a really fantastic book that highlights all the work that Lauren was just mentioning. Um, all right. Ginger wants to know from Woodbury, Minnesota, since primates can see in color, do you think their vision is more important than their sense of smell in finding food? Yeah, so for most primates, um, other than lemurs, their sense of vision is better than their sense of smell. Lemurs are the only ones that their, their sense of smell is better than their vision. Um, and so that's why as humans, we don't really have a very good sense of smell when you compare it to say like a dog. Fantastic. All right. Um, so chimpanzees, obviously the focus of the Jane Goodall Institute of Canada uh, and, and work's been done for many, many decades now. What have we seen in chimpanzee conservation over that time? Is the situation getting better? Is it worse? Can you explain a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely getting, it's definitely better. There's more protected areas. And the work we continue to do is to protect those areas and to really to lift up the communities that live near where the chimpanzees live. So this is community-centered conservation because Jane believes that everything is interconnected. So if the people that live near the chimps don't have access to good jobs and opportunities, then they're gonna take from the forest. But if they have those opportunities, then they won't, and they can let that forest grow and thrive, and then they can see a benefit in protecting those animals. Yeah, that ethic is something that we see now in all our conservation programs, pretty much universally, whatever animal people are working with, if local communities aren't behind it and aren't supportive of the protection of that species or that ecosystem, um, it doesn't usually work out, but it's nice to see when it does, it's fantastic. All right, this is a, a low bar question. What is the cutest species of primate in your opinion, Lauren? Um, I'm really partial to squirrel monkeys now, um, and I just think they're super cute. I actually did uh, lab research with them at my university. Um, I did cognitive research with them. So I just think they're super cute, and they're like little, and they're just like little fairies kind of, they have little pointy ears. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. Um, so you mentioned a few countries that you had a chance to visit when you were doing field work, uh, and in your work generally. Uh, where did you go in pursuit of primates? So could you explain a little bit about all the countries you might have seen when you're doing this? Um, yeah, it was, it was just Kenya and Tanzania that I did field work in. I had been lucky enough to also travel to Rwanda to see the mountain gorillas and chimps, uh, to Madagascar to see the lemurs, and also to um, Namibia and Zambia as well. Um, I'm very lucky that I have um, a mom who loves primates in Africa as much as I do and has given me the opportunity to travel with her there. Fantastic. All right. Um, we're getting a few more questions on YouTube, but I just want to encourage everyone uh, type in as many as you can. We still got plenty of time. So if you have questions, uh, keep them coming. Um, what is your favorite part of your job? This is a question we get pretty much every single session we have. Is there anything that really stands out to you, Laura? Um, my favorite part is just seeing at the end of the year, all the amazing projects that our youth do um, across Canada with Roots and Shoots. Um, unfortunately, with the pandemic this year, everything's been pushed a little bit. So I'll have to wait till next spring to find out all of those. But it's really amazing to see the work that youth do across this country and the impact that the program has on them and their local community. Outstanding. Um, so one of the queries was about uh, have you watched any National Geographic or other movies about <laughs> primates? And I'm going to extend that. Is there anything you'd recommend if someone's at home and they want to learn more about JGI Canada, if they want to learn more about primates, where are some resources that we can send them to, you know, beyond just your site uh, to find out more? Um, well, the Jane movie, I think it's on Netflix right now. I don't, I'm not exactly sure, but I think it's on one of those streaming services. Um, the Jane documentary is amazing in terms of looking at her past footage, so some of the archival footage from National Geographic. Um, and Disney has done some really good documentaries, nature documentaries as well. The whole nature series is pretty well done. Um, they have a chimp one. They have one about animals in Asia that looks at snub-nosed monkeys, which are super cute and funny with their blue faces. Um, so yeah, so I would point them towards that. And like Nat Geo is amazing. They have so many great, really well done documentaries. And also the Planet Earth series um, with uh, David Attenborough has awesome um, looks at Africa and primates and across the world. 
Amazing. Um, Jane Goodall's is on Netflix. I just passed a link to the trailer for it. <laughs> that bars if you guys want to check that out. Our Planet, also an Attenborough series, also on Netflix right now. So basically, when you leave this session, you can go home and watch a ton of nature documentaries, learn about some really, really fantastic primates. Um, Lauren, before we wrap up, so kids are at home and they're keen. We've highlighted roots and shoots to them. What can we what can we do right now if we leave this session and we want to do stuff to protect primates in the world? Um, can you give us some suggestions or what would work best? Sure. Um, I think the biggest thing, like I mentioned, is to not share any videos or photos you see of chimps or any primates kind of in a pet or dressed up situation. So we really want to kind of nail home the fact that this is not good. We need to um, kind of stop the wildlife trade, especially when we know that things like the coronavirus came out in a wildlife market where you have all these wild animals packed together. Um, and I think just to kind of, you know, we're all stuck at home and we can't really go out and do much. But I've seen in my neighborhood amazing posters and signs out there um, just encouraging everyone to stay safe, stay healthy, stay positive. Um, and in terms of protecting chimps, um, just spread the message that, you know, chimps are endangered. You know, tell your friends, spread positive messages about chimpanzees and their plight. Um, and just share information that is credible, that is um, accurate. Um, and yeah, I think that's that's kind of what we can do right now. <laughs> it is. Education is such a huge part of this. And this is something, again, that is echoed by every conservation partner that we have, but just sharing the message. If you learn today, uh, if you grow to love primates because of today's presentation, share that with people around you. And that does a world of good. Um, National Geographic actually had a whole series recently on the pet trade and animals used mm. in, in markets and, and dressed up. And so if you want to check out a really great resource on that, I'll try and find that link it to you in this. Um, we did just get another quick question. So I want to pass it along from Ginger. Were you afraid when you were surrounded by these buffalo? And what would your guard have done if they'd gotten too close? Um, it was a little nerve wracking, of course. Um, but I, I trusted them. And we also, we always had, a, he had a gun as well, which wouldn't be used to shoot the animals. It would be more used to just scare them away. Um, so that's kind of a last case resort. Um, but it's amazing. These trackers, they would see elephants that would maybe only be 20 feet away from us. And then you couldn't see because of the bush and it's dense. And he'd be like, oh yeah, there's an elephant there. Cool, let's go the other way. Um, so I trusted them. They know what they're doing. They've grown up there. They, they are very uh, well-versed in that. So. I hope everyone who's tuning in gets a chance sometime in their life to go to East Africa. It is pretty much universally regarded as like a, the best experience of your life for anyone who's ever got a chance to do it uh, for exactly this reason. So Lauren, thank you so much for the presentation today. And we really appreciate you joining us. You're welcome. Thank you so much. All right, for everyone tuning in at home, do continue to check us out. Over 100 programs in the month of April alone featuring scientists, explorers, and great facilities. So we look forward to having you back soon and have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye, Lauren, and bye, everyone else.